Hello, what went wrongers? Thanks for tuning in. We're not back yet. We will be back next week with our season five premiere. But this week, we have got a special feed drop episode that we are sharing on behalf of friend of the pod, Dave Kamides. If you don't remember, he is an incredible Steadicam operator. He has won many awards, including but not limited to two Emmys. To learn more about Dave, subscribe to our Patreon, where we have an interview talking to him about his job and his projects. It is so informative. Dave is the best, and Dave is rolling out his own podcast called The Op. The Op is a peek behind the curtain into the eyes and mind of the camera operator to see what operators and other crew do and how they do it, while also showing that by no means do they do it alone. The episode that we're sharing here is an interview between him and Tommy Schlamy, an excellent director who has directed countless episodes of TV, including ER, The West Wing, The Americans, House of Cards. Seriously, just go look at his IMDb page. It is bonkers. They talk about their shared experiences and discuss on-set best practices and much, much more. It's really great. Please listen to it. I promise you're going to enjoy it. To hear more episodes like this, search for The Op on Spotify. And finally, don't forget to tune in next week when we come back with the season five premiere of What Went Wrong. It's a doozy. And a journey. See you next week. Hey there, we've got a great episode for you today. Some of the topics we're going to touch on are getting yelled at as a PA, soap operas, The West Wing, The Americans, live TV, an actor conflict on the first day of directing ER, and of course, everybody's favorite, air conditioning. Today's episode does include a few swear words, and at the 13-minute mark, there is a very brief mention of a sexual act involving the President of the United States, so be aware. Just a little bit of business before we start. As always, the website is up at www.theop.io. Feel free to take a look around, and if you're interested, become a member, and you can watch the breakdown where operators talk about everything that goes into the making of a shot and read the musings where I talk about everything from quick tips to larger concepts behind operating. I may or I may not take a couple of breaks during this episode, but I promise you none of them will be longer than 22 seconds. So enjoy the op, and thanks for listening. Lock it up, nice and quiet, and let's roll. Rolling. Victor, 30 echo take two. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. And camera set. Back and action. Hello, and welcome back to the Op Podcast, the podcast where we talk about operating, the art of visual storytelling, and everything involved in it. I am your host, Dave Kamides, uh, and I'm very excited to uh, have a guest today who is a friend, a collaborator, a great director, a great producer goes on and on. Um, Tommy Shalami, he is a uh, director slash producer slash everything else on, um, among other things, West Wing, Snowfall, Parenthood, The Larry Sanders Show, ER, So I Married an Axe Murderer, Tracy Takes On, several ABC After School specials, which I'm going to ask you about. Um, one of the funniest things I've ever seen uh, that I didn't know about till I met you, Tommy, uh, Rowan Atkinson Live, which if anybody has not seen that, they should. Uh, and two unbelievably underrated shows, uh, Sports Night in Manhattan, which if you haven't seen them, please rush out and watch them. Uh, 23 uh, uh, nominations for awards and 20 wins, including eight Emmys, five DGA awards. He was the president of the DGA for a while. Um, and uh, hopefully you're going to tell us about the night you spent in the White House as well. <laughs> a very interesting Interesting guy, Tommy. Thank you for being here. My pleasure, Dave. Thank you for doing this. Uh, it's uh, this is it, it's like it's a blast to sit down and talk to you because uh, Tommy and I have worked together a ton and we've shared a ton of stories, but uh, we never really sat down and just shot the show. We've shit. never done it with a microphone in front <laughs> no, of us. With a microphone two <laughs> inches in front of your mouth. Um, so, hey, can you tell me the Tommy Shalami story in in five or ten minutes of how you got to where <clears> you are? Yeah, or you can edit it in five or ten minutes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, yeah, you know, look, uh, I, I think the truth of it is, as you probably have now observed by doing these, that everybody's story is completely different. And 100%. certainly everybody's director's story. There is no, well, I got my master's, then I had two years internship, and then I, it's alchemy, it's not chemistry. Actually, the truth um, of the matter is, if I had to bring it down to something, most of them is, and then I stumbled into this, and then I stumbled yeah. into well, that. Well, that's exactly, I will tell you how yeah. I stumbled into it. Okay. I stumbled into it because of air conditioning. Uh, <laughs> and I was sort of, uh, you know, my father was in the office supply business. I was... Uh, 
uh, what I knew is I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew what I didn't want to do, okay. and that was not be in my father's business. I just didn't figure out how I was going to tell him or what I was going to do in my life. Okay. That. So I was kind of a high school jock. I played basketball and football in high school, um, and we were had two a day workouts, which were you know in August in Houston, Texas, okay, well, which was fun. about 110 <laughs> degrees and humid, and they would give you salt tablets, oh. and uh, they would because school wasn't even out, and we we weren't even in school, and they would watch you through binoculars. So I was I had gone to a two a day exhausted, and my closest friend at that time. Uh, is a, an actor named Brent Spiner who plays Data on Star Trek. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. And he was my closest friend. And he said to me, we, we were driving around that night, and he said, you know that the drama building is air-conditioned. It's the only <laughs> room in all of this high school, which had 3,000 kids in it, that was air-conditioning. And I went, well, you know, they invited me into there from my speech <laughs> class. Maybe I should do that. And basically, I joined the drama class, and it changed my life because I met a guy named Cecil Pickett, which is also probably a story that you hear. I had one teacher who saw something in me that I did not see. Oh, wow. And um, so at that time, I was really fascinated by becoming an actor. And then I even got a scholarship to the University of Texas, a theater scholarship, um, of which my father was like, I don't understand what you're doing. Do you know (laughs) what? This makes no sense. And I went, it's just, you know. And by the way, when I say a scholarship, Tuition at the University of Texas at that time was $50. So the scholarship was not thousands of dollars. It yeah. was basically $50. And I went to the theater department. I was there for about, and by the way, in this high school theater yeah. was myself, Trey Wilson, who was an extraordinary actor, played Nathan Arizona and, oh, yeah. uh, oh, you know, uh, passed away, unfortunately. Oh. Randy Quaid, Dennis Quaid, Marianne Williamson. Oh, my uh, God. Yeah. Brent. Uh, myself, and then uh, quite a few other people who went on, all because of Cecil Pickett, this one teacher. Wow. So he was so inspirational. Then I got to the University of Texas, and it was um, not the theater department that I wanted to be part of. So I dropped out, became a history major. And every day I would walk home by the film building, which at that time was a house. It was a film house. Oh, wow. And I went, these are people I want to hang out with. Yeah. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're the people I want to hang out with. And I drifted into that building and I haven't left. Amazing. Then. That's yeah. a great story. Yeah. Uh, and then moved to New York um, after school. And then that story, this point, is just work begat work begat work. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, you mentioned the after school special. Yeah. Uh, it was, you know, first I worked at an animation studio. Uh, it was the first job I could get after driving a cab in New York. Uh, <laughs> and Worked in this animation studio. Uh, then I met somebody there. And then at that studio, they let me start to shoot the live action part of the animation, okay. which I was like, I could, I remember shooting the oranges for Oaf would carry in the Hawaiian Punch commercials. Whoa. And it was Bill Baird, who was a famous puppeteer, yeah. did it on monofilament, and I could shoot. And to me, it, I might as well have been, you know, Fellini. That's, uh, how, old, was, how old are you at this point? I was like, probably 23. 23? 23. Okay. 23 um, and it's not a member of the DGA. This was nine years. You know, it's just the animation part yeah. of it. Uh, <clears throat> and so then started doing commercials for this company, shooting the commercials. Then I started doing theater commercials where it was sort of – I was kind of a socialist uh, filmmaker. I would go to small shows. I would say, I can write you a commercial. I'll shoot it at cost. And as long as the show runs, you pay me X amount of dollars. Wow. Uh, And I did Little Shop of Horrors, Uh and that paid my rent for the next two years. That's fantastic. Uh, It was fantastic. That's great. Uh, And then the the big thing in New York, these after-school specials were huge because it was young filmmakers. Yeah. uh, if you got one, it was the way to enter television in some I ways. I had no idea. Because yeah. for anybody who's listening who doesn't know what it was, they were on at like, what, four in I the afternoon? Four, yeah, right after school. They ABC, announced? they were yeah. ABC after school specials. And then they would have like little things in the middle of it of, you know, and remember, if you smoke cigarettes. Yes, and, uh, <laughs> that's what I remember. You know, uh, they were very sort of like moralistic. Oh, and, I, and my, my so- first one was, can a guy say no, which was about <laughs> losing your virginity. Oh, I need to find uh, this. Is this and, available somewhere? Uh, and Jeff Jewer was the cinematographer. Jeff and, Jewer was yeah, the cinematographer. And 15, 20 years later, we did a pilot together sure. and have tried to work many times together. Oh, yeah. But we met on that. And then I did another one, which was uh, Della Reese about a gospel family. And Tempest Bledsoe was 
the oh young girl God, who was from the Cosby Show. But you, you uh, know, you know what? Just to stop you for a second, this is something that's interesting because I think when you're starting out your career, you're working on these things that it's you're working on anything you can, right? right. It doesn't make a difference. I mean, like my big thing was I used to work on these horrible rap videos with Maddie Libatique. And and that's how I learned how to yeah. move a steady camera. Yeah. So it's just like it's doing whatever is available and just doing it to the best of your ability and trying to learn. Well, that's right? the whole thing. Work beget work. All yeah. I could say is be the best PA you could be. Yeah. And don't tell everybody what I'm going to do is direct eventually. <laughs> just be a great PA. Yeah. You'll find a way. People will go, fuck, that guy's a really good PA. Yeah. I wonder if he could help me in research. Exactly. or. Burley Wartees, a very first show that I ever got a job on as a PA yeah. was a movie called, I think it was called The Money. And Brent Spiner had gotten a small role uh -huh. and said, I'm, I'm making this movie. Oh my gosh. And the cinematographer, this is a really good thing to talk about. And I think the operator was a guy named Todd Crandall. Okay. I believe I remember them both because they adopted me in some ways. That's so great. And it made me, it connected me to that part of filmmaking, yeah. cinematographers and operators, that to this day, I still feel that's the closest relationship I have outside wow. of, along with actors. Uh, and it was because of this gentleman, Burley Wartees. And you were just a, a standard on set PA doing whatever. I was a standard on set yeah. PA making, I think, $50 yeah. a week. Yeah. Okay. But I, I was on a movie set. Sure. And, um, the story was they adopted me and they saw that this guy, you know, is just so excited. He's there every day. And they started to say, why don't you be a PA in the camera department? Okay. Which then meant eventually I was loading the Mitchell. Oh, no. And uh, I would put my hand in that black bag. That's and cool. There was a whole lecture of if you fuck up, just let us know. Yeah. Please yeah, don't yeah. try to cover it. Uh, and it was just the most exciting thing in the world to me. That's um, amazing. So I worked on that thing. And what happened was... The, the the director was incredibly abusive, and it was way over his head. He was uh, the actor was Larry Luckinbill, uh, okay. who uh, at one point uh, it was he stormed off the set. Larry Luckinbill wow. screamed and yelled and said, "This is the worst set I've ever been on. It's the most unprofessional group of people I have ever worked with. I cannot deal with this." And storms off the set. I was like, "Whoa, God, this is Hollywood. Yeah, yeah right. This is what." Uh, <laughs> anyway. About two hours later, he shows back up at the set, and he goes, uh, I'm ready now. Uh, and he stands there, and Burley Wartiz, who was behind the camera at that moment, wasn't shooting, but was behind the camera, was a big bearded man, a, a really, you know, this kind of looked like a uh, mountain man. The Grizzly uh, Adams the or Grizzly something. Grizzly Adams kind of guy, <laughs> but a soulful human being and a true artist, stepped in front of the camera put his body between the camera and Larry Luckinbill and looked at him and said, Mr. Luckinbill, I just want you to know that my crew are very professional and we will not shoot this until you apologize to us. Wow. And did it without hostility, just without just matter of fact. gratitude. I mean, being humble yeah. and the gratitude of the people that I get to work with and they don't deserve to be called this. That's amazing. And Larry Luckinbill looked at Burley and said, Mr. Wartiz, I just want you to know I apologize deeply to you and to your crew and to everybody else on this set. Everybody knew who I was talking about. And then he turned, looked directly at the director and said, Mr. Whatever his name was, yeah. I'm ready now. Uh, clearly wow. telling everybody it's the director's it's, problem. It's the direct it was none of your problems. Interesting. Uh, and it, it connected me as a PA to the importance of this group of filmmakers who mm -hmm. show up every day to work and kind of carried it through for the rest of my career. That's amazing. I mean, it's also, it's amazing that it happened. It's amazing that it happened at that young of an age and you, you, you clocked how important that was. That's fantastic. Yeah. And that I also was screamed at by this guy. But, I mean, by the, by, by the, the director, director, by the director, by the director. Okay. screamed at because I was carrying the Mitchell to uh, Todd, I believe it was, he might have been the key grip. I'm not sure. But uh, uh, to uh, across the set, and he was rehearsing, and he was obviously flustered. And I was behind him, and he okay. turned to me and went, what the hell are you doing? And screamed because at me. you were now the everybody. problem, not him. No, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing was, oh, you know, great. Uh, the most important person supposedly on the set screams at the least important person yep. on the set. You, yep. you know, coward. Uh, wow. And also was a great sort of locked in lesson uh, mm -hmm. of that time. So that's amazing. Yeah. So, and so then you went from there to West Wing. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then uh, I met Aaron Sorkin. Yeah, and then, uh, and then yeah. Uh, and then I think I got an Emmy. So just, I don't know what the yeah, fuck Yeah, just backing up, actually. So anybody who's a West Wing fan who's listening to this, basically, they need to look up whoever created air conditioning. And that is why the West there Wing you go. exists. Well, no. Now, the West Wing, on the other hand, I got the West Wing. I, I started the business because of air conditioning. And I got the West Wing because of blowjobs. <laughs> not mine. Not mine. Because the president of the United States took advantage of an intern. Ah, uh, okay. The truth of it is, I got the script of Sports Night and West Wing on the same night uh, from my agent. Uh, Are you serious? Not saying you should do these. No, no. But going, just... Ari Emanuel sent me these two scripts, and I'm a notoriously I'm dyslexic, so I'm a very slow reader. Mm -hmm. And I got them on Friday, and I'm just really, uh, you know, I thought, okay, there's some more scripts. It's Possibly a pilot, because I was doing a lot of pilots at that And it's time. worth mentioning Aaron Sorkin wasn't Aaron Sorkin. So no, it Aaron an, Sorkin was a it few was a, good men on Broadway. Yeah, it, uh, had not done any television, had not done anything. So I get both these scripts. I had sort of known of Aaron Sorkin through the producer who did my very first movie, Lewis Allen, who had worked on – it produced uh, – uh, a Few Good Men, of okay. which he had given me 10 years earlier, the play, wow. say, could you read this tonight? I said, I'm making my first movie. I don't have time oh, to read while it. you were play. Yeah, And I went, <laughs> I started reading it on a Friday and just yeah. couldn't put it down. Oh, my God. That's what happened that Sunday night. I opened up Sports Night and West Wing. I read them both. I called Ari at, I think it was midnight, yeah. his, at his home. Yeah. And I said, look, I don't know what I have to do here, but I would love to get a meeting. I think these are both, I think it's the best half hour script I've ever read and the best hour Both script. of them are unbelievable. Yeah, so if there's any way I can get a meeting. And yeah. so what happened was I did get a meeting on sports night. I actually got that meeting the day after Jimmy Burroughs had met with Aaron and ABC was adamant, you know, that this is kind of a different script and because, Jimmy can ground it yeah. and make it something. Because Sports Night was a 30 minute show and Jimmy Burroughs is the was king the, of, uh, of and, and brilliant the at 30 it. Minute, Incredibly yeah, absolutely. brilliant. So I met with, I, I thought I was just going to meet at Imagine and Aaron was there. And so I met with Aaron and Imagine and yeah. Aaron asked me the question, how would you change this to make it a little bit more traditional so that the audience, and I said, I wouldn't change it at all. And this is how I would shoot it. And I described how I would shoot it, exactly how we ended up shooting it. Wow. I left the meeting, and he said, I'm not doing the show unless that guy does it. That's uh, amazing. And that was our first time ever meeting. And it had to go before West Wing, because West Wing was put on the shelf. Oh. Because okay. it was like, this would, you know, this was right at that moment. This isn't and they're going to going, well right now. Uh, now we're going to talk about the sanctity of the Oval Office. It's yeah. going to be titters. Let's just, uh, oh, we're not going to wow. be able to do this show right now. That's amazing. And because of that, it got... Delayed for a year. I would have never gotten that hour, hour pilot ever, yeah. ever, ever. And Aaron and I created a relationship on Sports Night that yeah. was so solid and such a really good collaborative process that he went, I want to, when we do West Wing, I want you to do it. There you go. That's yeah. a roundabout way yeah. to get that. Um, yeah. And and yeah, I don't know if anybody can pull anything out of that, but feel free to <laughs> yeah. try. Yeah. Just uh, wait for the next scandal. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it'll be but, to your advantage. I'll, well, there is something to pull out of that, yeah. which is, for operators, for cinematographers, for all of us, for actors, you don't know what the opportunity is going to be. That's exactly So you can chart it all out. You can say, oh, my God, I'm operating with this DP. It's going to be the greatest experience. Or I'm having a meeting with this DP yeah. to get this job, and you don't get it, but the meeting went really well. And two years later, that DP calls you up. Yep. And that's why you just – to chart it all out is a little bit foolhardy. Yeah, well, I think you try, but it's just you realize it's never yeah. going to go that way and whatever. But but for anybody, not I, and I know I said it earlier, Sports Night, I think, is one of the best shows that most people have never seen. The episode two, The Apology. Yeah. The last, what is it, five minutes or one right. minute where he's speaking to Talks the cameras. Talks about what happened. Is honestly one of the most breathtaking pieces. Well, I'll tell you, it's, great, it's, very it's quickly. incredible. Very quickly. <laughs> so we sell the pilot. I mean, the pilot gets picked up. Yeah. There was a big controversy, obviously, for Aaron and I that we didn't want to laugh track. We didn't want to do it in a traditional way. Has anything ever been done a 30 minute before that that way without in that? Not well, by the way, we did have a laugh track, but it was oh, so, it, yeah, it, it, it's so, if you listen to it now, okay. if you watch it now, it seems like Uncle Morty's yeah. laughing in the corner. Uh, but I guess what I'm saying was that like, like. No, there was no way that this, the way that we shot that show had ever been done before. Okay. What had been done is single camera shows that had been, you know. 
Gomer Pyle and yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Happy Days, and but, but not cookie, Happy Days, cookie cutter kind of stuff. Yeah, but but we're single camera, sort of. Uh, and the whole restriction that I had as a filmmaker mm-hmm. was this: you can shoot it any way you want, Tommy, but you only have three days to do that with a crew, because the idea of half hour television was. Yeah. To, you know, you would have your camera crew would do Drew Carey on Monday and Tuesday, yep. and then that would be a Tuesday night show, mm-hmm. and then there would be a Friday night show. So that same crew would then go over yep. and Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday do another show. They double so double. that was yep. if you can figure out how to do it on a Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, and shoot your show that way, and only have three days to shoot it, mm-hmm. then you know, Godspeed. Even though they wanted did. me not to do it that yeah, way, yeah, yeah, and so. That's how I sort of came up with shooting this thing, which I still think is was one of the great joys, which was two total days of rehearsal. That's all it was. Uh, it was just putting it on its feet and doing the whole play in two days. You'd get the script Sunday. Yep. You would uh, sort of block it out. You would work on it. Tuesday, late afternoon, I'd run the whole show for Aaron to see to make sure he felt comfortable with everything. Yeah, yeah. And then Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we just came in and shot it. Wow. And... So you were shooting 12 pages a day or whatever it was, but uh, it was sort of okay because it was all rehearsed. And then we would have like a live audience come to see part of it oh, okay. because it was so much the steady cam. Yeah. And it was so uh, the idea of not the technical part of the steady cam, but the idea of a live show, mm-hmm. the excitement of the movement of a live show, how to do that. And fortunately, the technology was there for yeah. us to be able to do yeah. that. Um, That's amazing. I think Jerome Fossey was your steady cam operator. He was. Yeah. But I learned that technology, the steady cam technology. I don't know if you ever know this no. from soap opera, from uh, <laughs> another job I got. Okay. Which was an, after the after school special. All right. My agent calls me up and says, uh, and this is an operator steady cam story, so okay. it's okay. No, I like it. Uh, but this is all great. My. Uh, Agent called me up. I remember being in New York. I remember uh, calling my agent back from a phone booth because you would, oh, you know. Phone booth. Yeah, I'll explain that after yeah, the podcast. Yeah, exactly. Picture. And it was a rotary dial. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I called the agent, and, and my agent says, we just got a call from the soap opera One Life to Live, and they would be interested in you. And I went, what are you talking about? I just did my after-school special. Yeah. I'm going to get a feature now. I mean, that's what happens. <laughs> I, I, got, I broke you in. Have any idea I'm telling I stories. I had been doing commercials. I'd been doing this other stuff. And now I got this after-school special. And they said, yeah, you know what? Uh, just meet with this guy. He, yeah. he really does want to meet you. He's a guy named Paul Rausch, who was the executive producer. I went to go meet with him, and it was... By far, the most elegant office I'd ever been in. It was all mahogany. It was off 66th Street right by Lincoln Center and a house that was ABC and beautiful. And really, this guy, and he starts talking about my after-school special, Jeff Jewer shot. And uh-huh. he's going, there's a lot of night exterior. Did you shoot that on 16? Did you use uh, – what kind of lighting did you wow. – and it was like – this guy is you doing expected. soap operas. Yeah, I thought, yeah. cue camera four, <laughs> you know, the organ. Yep. I didn't know what – you know. <laughs> uh <laughs> And he's asking me all about how I shot it, how I blocked it. I mean, truly filmmaking questions. Yeah, yeah. And then he says, let me tell you why I'm meeting with you. Occasionally, uh, we go on these remotes. And what I've been doing Mm -hmm. in the last couple of years is I find young filmmakers who I kind of are going, oh, you're just starting out, but you have clearly an an interest in filmmaking. And go, why don't you come shoot our remotes? Because it's not done. It's done as single camera stuff. And um I was like, uh, oh, yeah, and now I'm somewhat interested, sure. but I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go to the Paramus Mall <laughs> to shoot something. And he says, because we're thinking this year of going to Vienna. And there you go. And I went, <laughs> I went, Austria? And he said, yeah, and I said, because personally, I've always wanted to do soap operas, so this is a this perfect way. This is a perfect way. example. Anyway, the next thing I know, we're going to go scout Vienna. Wow. Now, in the process, I'd been working a lot with Lauren Michaels' company, Broadway Video, okay. doing stuff with them. And one of the producers for Lauren said, you know, we used this guy in Milan, uh, in Italy, a incredible steady cam operator. And uh-huh. he's a great operator and he's an incredible guy. And he's in Europe and you're going to need somebody. Uh, and... You know, you should give him a call. And his name was Nicola Piccarini. Nicola Piccarini. And uh, I was like, okay. I wasn't even sure I knew the Steadicam. I had obviously— What year, what year uh, is it? Like- gosh. 
Early 80s. What, what year was uh, the Garrett? What, what, when? 75, 76. Yeah, so this is probably 80, 81. Okay. So, it's, yeah. so, it's, so it's a thing, but it's not it's a, everywhere. No, no. It's means. Ted Churchill here. Yeah, there's it's, a couple of people. Uh, yeah. It's Nicola yeah. in Europe. And so, but I knew, I mean, I'd seen Marathon Man, so that would already happen. Sure. Bound yeah. for Glory had already happened. And I was like, God, to try to do this. And I think I had done one commercial with Ted Churchill. Okay. Uh, uh, I a theater commercial that we did one shot. And so I was interested thinking that'd be a really cool way to to figure out this technology because I I was like, I'm not going to get a script. I'm no, not going to, no, no. you know, the fact of it is I'm not going to give an actor any direction. It's yeah. going to be, uh, maybe you should play like you don't know this. For, well, that, you know, that my husband is also my brother. And uh, my <laughs> I'm going, okay, uh, I'll want. leave that up to you guys. I've never seen a soap opera. And so I met Nicola and... Uh, we went and we scouted Vienna and we scouted railroads and I mean they gave us enormous amounts That's of money. That's incredible. And I then started to really understand yeah. the the craft and the art of this piece of instrument. Yeah. Uh, which then stayed with me. Obviously, it's in our relationship and it's been, you know, a very important instrument. Not in, oh, I think it's a cool instrument in the way that I like to tell stories, sure. which is a much more continuous and a much more fluid way than sort of traditional filmmaking. Was and, Sports Night the first time you, you really sort of started to explore that on that level? No, because it was really Larry Sanders. Oh, um, okay. And it wasn't the steady cam. Yeah. It was pretty much handheld. It yeah. was, um, yeah, so Peter Smokler and I had done... Um, the Larry Sanders, and I set up the Larry Sanders show. It yeah. was not one of my better uh, career choices. <laughs> Setting up Larry Sanders was a great career choice. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Taking Axe Murderer ah. uh, before yeah. we started shooting Larry Sanders oh. and walking away from it was not one of my better. Uh, okay. I mean, I, it, it, they, it all works out for the best. But, sure, um, it seems to have worked out. But I had set it up, and yeah. part of setting that up was this sort of multi-camera way of shooting things. Yeah which I had done even with Mad About You. Didn't do a lot of half hour, but mm -hmm. I started to do half hour and Mad About You was one in which I did because I knew Paul Reiser and he asked me to come do this. Yeah. And I went, I don't get why the cameras don't push in. Oh, I, I, I literally don't get why you have a line here and it has to be proscenium. Yeah. And everything has to be shot from out there. Because Cam it was shot like a standard four camera show where they were in the back looking, yeah, looking at the flat Yeah, it was just very side, much. So, and yeah. it was proscenium and yeah. it was the way you shoot it and the audience can see yeah. it and the cameras aren't in the way and yep, yep, they're moving yep, around yep. with all their marks. And, and these were incredible operators. Yeah. These were guys who were hungry. So I remember doing Mad About You and going, oh, just push in. We can shoot down the hall that way. Yeah. And lighting had become more sophisticated, sure. so and the stock was more sophisticated. So these guys, and we actually did an episode of Mad About You called 15 Minutes, okay. in which the first uh, commercial break is uh, not one shot, but continuous. Wow. It's just continuous. So it's it, we did it as a play, but I mean, they're in the scenes, and it was about hidden cameras oh, wow. all over. He's a documentary filmmaker, uh, so he's shooting that. that. Uh, and I just watched these operators just uh, really just a, a level of excitement That's and so cool. appreciation yeah. of what their talent really was. Because even though they had to be really good at this proscenium part yeah. uh, and get to where they needed to get to, uh, they hadn't been asked to really push into a scene and shoot a scene yeah. the way that they would want to shoot a scene. Sure. Uh, so. That's amazing. Anyway, N Nicola, we did – Yeah, yeah. We did – Vienna. Uh, then uh, three months later, I get a call from uh, this guy again. He goes, have you seen The Mission? I went, the Jeremy Irons De Niro mm -hmm. movie? Yeah. Yeah. It's an extraordinary movie. You remember the falls, the Iguazu Falls? He <laughs> says, yeah, I'm thinking about sh throwing Tina, who I didn't know who the fuck yeah. Tina was, <laughs> over the falls. Uh, and I'm going, sounds like a sounds scout great. to Brazil uh, <laughs> yeah. to me. And then, and then we call Nicola. And Nicola and I meet oh, uh, in Brazil. That's fantastic. Scout it, come back and shoot it, and shoot it all on steady cam. That's everything. Great. Yeah. And by uh, the way, you're learning from one of the best. I mean, he's fantastic. Yeah, and you know, so and then incredible. Nicola and I became very, very yeah, close yeah. friends. And yeah. I actually gave Nicola his very first cinematography. I mean, DP job. Oh, I didn't uh, know. That. On Tracy Takes On. Ah. He he shot it because he also operated for me. I did a. And it's something I'd love to talk to you about and, yeah. and your own experience in this, which yeah. is we did a, a 
movie for TNT called Kingfish with John Goodman about okay. Huey Long. Yeah, I remember Shot at this. New Orleans. Yeah. It was a really uh, a wonderful piece. And Alexander Grzynski yep. uh, was the DP. And Nicola was the uh, A camera, steady cam guy. Yeah. And it was a tough relationship. Didn't go uh, well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it went okay. Yeah. But the, the and, and it was, you know, I, I sort of, I worked much better in harmony than in cacophony. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so... There was a little bit of cacophony going okay. on there. Uh, Not that that and, ever happens anywhere else. Yeah. And <laughs> so, uh, and a little bit of that was Nicola sort of second guessing Alexander. Uh, and he had already been DPing a little bit. So That's now he was yep. doing this for me. And then Alexander was also thinking that, you know, Nicola was judging him. Yeah. So that relationship was a balance that I had to sort of figure out. I had great respect for both of them. Sure. But, uh, and then I realized the next time I'm going to work with Nicola, he's going to be a DP. He's going to be a DP. He's yeah. not going to work well. He already is. With, so, uh, so in that case, let me ask you a question. Do you get very, very aware of who you're talking to about what and, yeah, and trying to I keep mean, a balance and so that you I don't only become aware them? of it because I want to be sensitive to That's what, what might happen. Yeah. Which is, by the way, the job of a director. The job of a director for me at least, is it's just as important for me to read the room as it is for me to also be able to tell a story that sure. I desperately want to tell. Yep. Everything is motivated, and I, I heard your wonderful podcast with uh, Roger Deakins, uh, and it was. But but Thank because you. it was so focused on storytelling, which is all I really care about. Yeah. I never care about what the equipment is, who that is, what that is. It's We've got to tell a story. But I also do care deeply in when I tell that story that we're trying to create a family yeah. that is also excited about telling that same story and that we're all moving in that direction. That doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of different ideas, yeah. which is really exciting to me. Yeah. But we're not pointing fingers at a lot of other people and making it truly a cacophonous family yeah. Yeah. as opposed to... Um, I, I think... A relationship that I have noticed over many years is the between the DP and the operator. Yeah. And sometimes it's so beautiful because when I watch you and John work and then when John Lindley. John yeah. Lindley. And then when I'm put in that ingredient too, it's like, oh, this is a you know, a beautiful little triangle that's sort of working, which is actually not a triangle, it's a circle. It's you know, and uh, and that's that's really great. Part of what I've learned over the years, which is just be very transparent with all the parties involved yeah. and try to get that to be a little bit more open and available. Um, but I've noticed it even to this day. I mean, this happened on um, the last thing I just did, uh, an uh, inc- incredible DP, uh, Craig Wablinski. Yeah. Uh, and it, it happened on Manhattan with Richard Wartowski. Yeah. Um, these are extraordinary operators. Uh in their, when they were operators. When they, when they, they were loved operating. it. Yes, yep. And so they're going, I don't know how to let go. completely let go yeah. yep. and not get frustrated when I'm at the monitor with the moment that the operator didn't see something yeah. that was right there. And, uh, and the, the irony of that is that, that, that what they are tending to do is probably what they exactly would not have wanted someone to do them. With no fault of no fault. But of that's the, it's fascinating. It, it, it's it very is. similar to actors directing the first time. I would agree I have with that. noticed <clears throat> that you would think actors are treating other actors the way they wanted desperately to be yes. treated. Yeah. But in fact, they get frustrated. Yep. And they're going, "Why are you?" And I'm thinking, "Wow, you're talking." I mean, not all. And then, by no, the way, no, there's some but, extraordinary actor. But it's understandable. With, Completely. Yeah. And it's really, and I can see, I could see Craig at times, who we had wonderful operators. Yeah. But, it, you know, and part of that was not about they, the operator, and this is really interesting. It wasn't that the operator didn't do what he the operator was there. told. Yeah, yeah. The operator didn't use their own instinct. Yeah. And, and with Craig, that was the whole thing. You're, you're a filmmaker too. I want you. Here's what it should be. Yeah. But be fluid in the moment. And to me... That's what separates. I think there was it's something you had mentioned once, you know, what separates really good operators from great operators. That's what I was, question I was going to ask you. Yeah, then. and I think for me at least, I mean, first of all, it is that they, they know the story as well as the DP knows the story, as well as the yeah. designer knows the story, as well as the director knows the story. Yep. That they're really involved in filmmaking and they're part of the process of filmmaking, not waiting for instructions yep. to be told what to do. Yeah. 
it'd be great. Here's what we need. And this is what, you know, should happen in the shot. But not to be, I mean, you're in the scene. Yeah. You are in the scene I think with the actor. You, and well, you're in the scene, but you're also, you're the only person in the moment when something happens that's yeah. out of the ordinary that you have to know how to seize on that or not seize on well, it. By the or way, move or not you're not move. the only one. Well, the, the actor is the other one. Actually, and well, in fairness, and the assistant and the dolly grip. And, yeah, and, but, but, but yes. what I'm saying is. No, no, no question. It's the same thing as an actor. Yeah. There are actors who, if something happens, they go, okay. Uh, wait, I'm sorry, that glass wasn't supposed to fall. As opposed to just... As opposed to, holy shit, they're completely in the fucking moment and they do something. It's the exact same thing with an operator. It's funny because is, there are moments that I, I can't think of what they are, but I know that this has happened with you where I've walked back to the monitor afterwards and like can, neither of us can believe what just happened. Yeah. Because something completely spontaneous and real happened that's so within the story... But and it's not great, acting, nor is it actor, operating, yeah. nor is it, it is just instinct it's, and it's uh, yeah. the, and truth, because you are really in it. Yeah. And to me, that's the, those operators, uh, and I've been fortunate enough to work with, besides yourself, many operators yeah. who have the ability to possibly make a mistake, because mm-hmm. that's what happens. What happens is, uh, it's easy if I just follow the rules. It's really easy. I, you told me that I just have to do Keep this. Your head and there down are some shows, by the way, yeah. you know, uh, if you, you know, shoot House of Cards, you're not improvising too much. <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, Fincher set up okay. something and there was a reason yeah. that you didn't pan and tilt and yep. you didn't. Uh, but, okay, that's that style. But if it's not that style, yeah. then uh, if it's somebody, if I'm directing something, if it's somebody saying to you, I want you to be the filmmaker. Yeah. I want you, I don't use below the line and above the, it's, there's 105 filmmakers showing yeah. up every yeah. day. And if everybody's coming to it with that and thinking that they have the ability to help shape it, uh, if is somebody knows what they want, that's also a nightmare if it's somebody who doesn't have any idea what they want and, and everybody's making decisions. And also isn't allowing you to help them figure that yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, that's where the it, problem I think is. they're both a problem. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, no question. I think if they allow you not to help them, that's a real problem. But if they're basically saying, save me here yeah. to everybody, yep. then 10 different people are coming from 10 different sources and you don't have somebody with a vision that's helping everybody bring their vision to it. So, um, Well, the, the thing you, you – circling, circling ironically back to what you said about John Lindley and, and yourself and myself working right. and it being a circle, which Manhattan, by the way, the second I heard it was a two of you, I was like, I'll, I don't care where it is, what it is, whatever, and turned out to be one of, one of the undiscovered gems that's out there. Um, <laughs> But, and and I'm sure you're aware of this, but maybe you're not, is, you know, we'll be rehearsing a scene and you'll be watching it and I'll be watching it. And I sort of usually do my little walk around to kind of look at stuff and John will be looking at it and you'll go this, 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 and this. And then, and then there are times where you'll look at me and you, I don't know, maybe I'm furrowing my brow or something and you'll just go, you have something better. <laughs> All right. And what are you thinking? And I'll go, well, what if we did it? And sometimes you say yes and sometimes you say no, but but is that you have a very specific idea of what you want and then you're absolutely happy to throw it out the window if something better comes along because it is all about telling the story. And John's the same way. It's like, okay, this is going to be harder to light, but it's a better way to do it. It's like, it, it, it's the end of the day is the story is what's important. Right. It's not, it's not who came up with what. And those are the, those are the perfect situations. But so let me ask you a question. Does, uh, I come on and I work with you. We have a ton of history. Uh, I know exactly, I know exactly what I can get away with, what I can't right. get away with, what you like, what you don't like. But a newer operator who comes in and comes into Tommy Shalami, how how do they know how do they know whether where that line is of how involved they should be, how in, how not involved they should be? I mean, is the, is there an answer to that question? I don't know. I, you know, look, I, I I think I think there is an answer to the question, but it it I know what I can say. Yeah. How it's received, I never know. In other words, how that person processes it, because I could be saying something to somebody. Yeah. Especially if I haven't hired that operator, because yeah. that uh, often is the case, sure. is that the DB, DP has hired that. Actually, recently, I've been doing, because mostly I've executive produced everything that I've done over the last So you step into years. an existing situation. Yeah, I've stepped into these limited series where I'll do half of the limited series with people that I have enormous respect for. Yeah. So it was true with Plot Against America, with David Simon, and, with, <clears throat> and the crew had already been uh, chosen. Yeah. Uh, and so... 
that's a very different experience for me, which I haven't had in a long time. Yeah, sure, um, sure, sure. But even when the DP has done it, I, not everybody will immediately trust the idea for two reasons. They won't trust the idea that I actually mean I want your ideas. So in other words, you'll say it to them and they'll go, yeah, but uh, he doesn't really well, want to hear it. Well, inside their head, it's like— <laughs> But I can't. Uh, Okay, the you know that's like an AD saying I never scream. Yeah, I'm not so sure. Screaming. So you, I, I think if they've already had experiences where they have been shut down a lot, mm-hmm. then even though someone's saying that, you have to sort of trust that through the process. Mm-hmm. Uh, or it's somebody who doesn't have that ability, and that is true too. Who they doesn't have, have the, ability the ability to ability. come in and say I have a better idea? Yeah, because yeah. they don't have a better idea. Yeah, and not because they're – That's it's, another it's, story. They are far more uh, comfortable with tell me what to do yep. uh, and I'll do it. It's sort of like I've never truthfully understood – I mean truly don't understand uh, A and B operators. I, I just have two A operators you have two from my a, point yes. of view. I, I mean, yes, do I use it? That it makes it a little easier because if it's only one camera, yeah. it's going to be or that person. Or if you have history with someone go, or, or whatever. I don't have to be Solomon going, yep. I think you're better at this <laughs> than that. Yeah. But the truth of it is I don't want a second camera operator to be less than the first camera operator. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it was sort of like when Aaron and I started doing television and they would tell us about sweeps episodes. And they were like, in the old days, for people who don't know what that was, those were these specific episodes that were for advertisers. And they would try, you know, they'd put more money into it and everything. And they'd tell you, these are your sweeps episodes. And we were like... Isn't every episode Isn't every a sweeps episode? To- episode? I, I mean, <laughs> I totally we're not see. going, oh, those weren't our very good ones. <laughs> now we're going to get to do a good one. But It was but, like every episode should be better than the next Sure, episode. but you yeah. know that that's not, not the norm probably with most people. Yeah, and I know yeah. the norm is also not that your A and B operators both Agreed. should yeah. have ideas. Yep. And that they should feel that they're not in competition with each yep. other. Yep. And that they're to eliminate all that competition that exists on a movie set. Yeah. Who has the voice? Who can say this? What yep. can be there? Uh, and, you know, the whole thing about, you know, if I work with you, for instance, and I bring you in as the operator and there's already a DP, I mm-hmm. have to be sensitive to the idea that I already have a relationship with you yep. and I'm not cutting the DP out. Yeah. In fact, I'm just trying to include all of that. Um, so it, it you're constantly trying to figure out yeah. how to manage a group of people who all are enormously talented. Yep. And want their t- want to be exploited. Yeah. Truth of it is, I want to be exploited. I don't want to be exploited in the ugly term of that. Yeah. But use me for everything I have. Oh, I see. What and you're so, yes. yeah. So you come to a set. You're being brought in as a steady cam operator, not even a. And, yeah. th- and they have one shot that's two people walking for uh, just in front of the camera. Mm-hmm. And you're going, what am I here for? Yeah. What am I doing this for? Do you know, it doesn't feel like you're exploiting all the other stuff that could come out of this moment. Yeah. Which is what I've also felt a little bit. And, it, you know, again, my experiences are limited to my experience. Of course. It's not like, here's the data on this. I don't know. But it is something that I have noticed in the world of operating is yeah. that it seems, and it's the same as, I think it's a the perfect example of also the steady cam. Do you know when I started the steady cam with Nicola and Ted Churchill yeah. and may he rest in peace and um, and then people that begat those people, people like yourself and everything. It was a, a, a an instrument of art. It really was this unique thing that you could sort of do with it. It wasn't just and I can remember a specific shot I asked you to do. Oh boy. A very specific shot <laughs> that was not supposed to be a steady cam shot. And it was and and I felt bad about it. Uh that, you, you mean for whatever reason we had to do it? On yeah, study I was camp? just running out of time, I and I yeah. needed this one shot, and it was uh, it was a very slow shot on Miss Landingham's desk, and it had to kind of come around, and it was bef- it was the which is the hardest thing sequence. in the world to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and mm-hmm. uh, and not the instrument's not built for no. it. Yeah. Lay some fucking track, yeah. and do this, and we didn't have time for it, and I had to have this shot, and it was in uh, two cathedrals, I think. Uh, because it was what he needed. He just needed pallbearers. I yeah. think that was okay. the moment. And we see an empty desk where she had died. Okay. And then you see him in the distance. And you just had to, it had to be really slow. 
and the horizon line needed to be straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of the things. Shot. Yeah. And I just remember it was the very first time that I went, I'm using this instrument Incorrect. the way other people <laughs> are using the instrument that frustrates me. Uh, and we had to do it, and it turned out to be great, and it was uh, but, a but, necessity. But it, there was a reason for that. Yeah, no, no, but, I, but, you know. but my point is yeah. I think that becomes now much more the norm. Yes. And the idea of this very unique dance of sort of doing something with this piece of instrument has become less, and it's just a, a time saver yeah. uh, as opposed to no one ever thought about it. I mean, yeah. Nicola and Ted or you or we weren't going, and this will save us a lot of time to go down three flights of stairs. Yeah, it was more. Uh, we could yeah, do more. Maybe we could do it. this we in can... four shots. We'd be out of here in a lot sooner. <laughs> uh, so um, anyway. Uh, yeah. And so what I was trying to say is that I, I believe I have found that in the way that now some people use the steady cam as a financial asset. Yeah. That, oh, look at this. If I learn how to do this, they'll pay me extra amount of money to do it. And that doesn't mean that they're not talented at doing it. It just means that the instinct to do it becomes less. So I wonder, is that the instinct to be an operator, to move up to be an operator? Uh And I feel the same about directors. There are times that I believe people have moved up to become directors because they went, wait a second, I'm sorry, you get paid what to direct? And this is what I get as my weekly? I think that's a really good thing. And Never thought when I was pursuing directing of, what are the finances of this? Uh, <laughs> never once, uh, and still don't. And thank God that people haven't caught on to that. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, I want I want to go back to something you said about when when because I think there's value in it. You know, you pull me onto a show with a DP that I've never worked with before, who obviously you've already already heard. There is a thing where when I come in, I have to be very very careful of making sure that I realize that I'm working for them. I'm working for you, obviously, and I'm not going to lie about the fact that they know that you and I have right. a shorthand in this and that and the other. But I'll start to make sure that I'm going to them more, you know, uh, right off the bat, or hopefully I do, anyway. So that they don't, And there are some who, who will come up to me on day two and go, look, just so we're clear, I know that you two have this thing and, like, we should exploit that. Like, it's all good. Don't worry about it. And then there are some who... who wouldn't be okay with that and and need me to need me to sort of have that deferential lack of a right. better word post so it's an interesting it's an interesting dance do you notice that yeah of yeah. course I notice that but i I'm pretty aware of it before it starts yeah because I would never bring you on without talking to a deep sure of about, course here I have a really strong suggestion you should meet with Dave this is what it would sort of be yeah uh, and it, so it I, again I think it's who that is. Mm -hmm. If I'm bringing you on because they're not doing a good job, that's a very different thing. And I can't think of that experience, Yes, you know? Uh, And I think I would be, I I think that would be wrong. It's a little bit, I remember my very first movie, Arthur Albert, who's a really wonderful, wonderful man. And doing ER and a bunch of other things. Yeah, the DP on my very first movie was Firecracker. And for the first three days, he was like, um, hey, have you uh, heard anything from the dailies? Have oh. you been getting anything about the day? He was like so nervous about the dailies. Yeah. And I was like, I mean, I was really nervous about the dailies too, but I didn't understand why Arthur was so nervous about the dailies. <laughs> and, and he'd been doing this. This was my first movie. And he said, I said, finally, I went, you know, yes, they, they saw it. They're very happy. And, and he said, Phew. I said, why are you, were you so worried? He said, because they're not going to fire you. Uh, uh, they'll that's fire very, me. That's very smart. Yeah. And, and I think that's a little bit about the operator. Yeah. You know, mm. I'm frustrated with the deep, yeah, yeah, these operator, just can we uh, get rid of that operator? That, yeah. So I'm going to, let's get rid the of problem. the operator. I'll bring in Dave yep. to do this. Yeah. Uh, would be, no, the problem doesn't exist. It's an operator. impossible situation. It, it, yeah. And, and yeah. then, and so that I would never do because I already know. Yeah. What the problem that, is. It's an uphill battle for you. It would be, I'm, I'm not, eliminating the problem. Mm-hmm. I'm just trying to fill the hole. Yeah. Uh, and so I think it, 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 like anything else, it, you have to be sensitive to those things. You have to be making sure that that person, yep. uh, is, and then to be really honest with that person. I mean, this happened in an experience with you Yeah. and I was very honest with the DP and he was honest with me. Do you know that he was basically saying, uh, you know, it's hard for me. It's hard for me with somebody who has a very strong point of view, yeah. and I've done this before, and he hadn't been a DP for that long, and had been more as an operator DP his whole career. Mm-hmm. So 
unlike myself, who's very open to all these uh, yeah. ideas, uh, that's more difficult. Not everybody that's has the same that as that you, I'm sure, run into many directors who it's like, I have an idea, but it's the very notion of giving that idea to that person makes it feel like they're making a mistake. Yep. Uh, yep. And that's the whole thing. It's what I've learned about actors. You know, there are actors whose first instinct with giving a note is that they fucked up. They, yeah, they've done and the wrong thing. It's like, thing okay, so I'm going to have to work around that. Yeah. Because it's so far from the fact that you fucked up. It's that we're working together here. Yep, yep. Uh, and then there are other actors who uh, are secure enough to know that, okay, what else? What else? Give me something else. But uh, I think that's what, what it all is, is, is yeah. it's security. It's it's knowing yeah. like, okay, I, this this was my choice, but that's not the choice you wanted. Um, and and to, to the reverse of what you just said, look, I understand what type of operator I am. And I'm not the type of operator who sits on the dolly and goes pan from 45 degrees to 60 degrees. And put, right. I just don't do that. So at the same point, I can't. I can't honestly take a job that that's going to be that and right. know that I'm going to be happy with it. So, you know, it's sort of, I think you have to be aware of it, but you brought up acting. Uh, can you talk about operators working with actors and yeah. what, what you expect of that? What's good, what's bad? I don't know. You know. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'll give you an example, an incredible example of where I think it, it, what I, what I said earlier, I think to you in this interview, which the idea that they're in the scene, Yeah. you know, I think of there's times where I've shot, and it's either handheld or a steady cam, and it's like a three person scene. Uh, happens to be the two actors yeah. and the operator. Yeah. And so that relationship between, for actors who have, start to have relationships with the operator is a really beautiful thing. Yeah. It's an incredible thing because they feel there's somebody I trust. There's somebody who's watching me. It's not the DP. It's literally the person who's right there with me, who saw my performance before anybody else sees my performance. Uh, so, and I, in this last job that I just had, there were two fairly, you know, greener operators. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, you know, and one would sort of get frustrated and sort of, I can't believe that happened, you know, and I'd go, you can't do that on the set. <laughs> Let me tell you why you can't do uh, that on the set. Yes. Because that scares the the person. And I get what you're doing. And I appreciate the fact that you're frustrated and that this didn't happen. Yep. But you're going to have to learn that you're part of the scene and these people are reading you. And so you will learn the art of duplicity here yeah. and the idea of trying to make that person feel safe. And that's part of your job. And many have no training for that and have no idea how to do that. And it's an extraordinary uh, when you see it. And those are those great operators that you've talked to, yourself, a lot of other people, who all of a sudden, they love these actors. They yeah. have this relationship. This is the best with part of actors. the job for me. I yeah. mean, not every job. And, but and I remember uh, <clears throat> two things. I remember Nicola once, uh, and it was actually on Kingfish. Mm -hmm. And it was a, l a little scene that John Goodman had with an incredible African-American actor named Bill Cobb. I remember, I remember I mean, Bill Cobb was uh, in Hudsucker Proxy. He was yeah. up in the tower. Oh, yeah. The yeah. beautiful Great sort face, of right? Incredible yeah. face. He was on ER, actually. Yeah. I, cast, I put him in okay. ER, and yeah. then I cast him in this. And it was just a scene about he was a porter, but it was really a scene about dignity and about, and this, and just without saying much. Uh -huh. And I remember Nicola, after the second take, he came to me and went, that's an actor with a capital A. Uh, <laughs> and I was like... Oh, I, we can move on. Yeah, uh, I had so I, I had seen it, but then he he it was so the operator was in that it scene him. with him. Yeah. It just moved him so much oh, yeah. in watching that yeah. fucking moment, and I realized he's not operating. He's there recording this extraordinary uh, piece of acting, and is there with him. Feels yeah. like I'm in the scene. Yeah, uh, and it was yeah. incredible. And then I did a sequence. And this was where I actually had asked the DP to be the operator because I also uh, knew uh, in this series, it was on the Americans. Okay. Uh, and that was a show that it was actually the first show Great in 20 show. something years that I just came because I knew the creators. They had, I had talked to them about doing the pilot. I wasn't available. And then the first season, they said, would you come do one episode? Yeah. And then I did a few and became very close with Matthew and Terry. Yeah. And Richard Rutowski again, who, who came in for John Lindley on Manhattan. Yep. Uh, but he was the DP. And they were wonderful operators. But Carrie 
and Matthew had a great relationship with Richard. And they, it was like a really beautiful kind of relationship. And I had a sequence in the show that Matthew has to pull Carrie's tooth. Uh, and brutally, a little marathon man. It had to thing. be, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. They couldn't go to a doctor. And I remember the actors being really, I'm not so sure, uh, they, were, they didn't like the scene. They thought it was a little bit gratuitous. And why are they doing this? Yeah. And, you know, the scene had a lot, the show had an enormous amount of uh, sensuality to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I basically started looking at the scene and realizing it's a scene about trust, total scene about trust. Yeah, sure. And it was also a scene that I said, this is the sex scene of this episode. Oh, wow. And they were like, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're, it's a marathon. Are there They're new pages? pulling my fucking tooth with a pair of pliers. Yeah. It, it's actually an extraordinary yeah. scene uh, and truly a scene of intimacy yeah, and trust yeah, that's clearly. brutal and hard to watch and very difficult because it's so painful. I mean, yeah, you know, but, but that is, that is a big part of being an operator that I personally love is when you do connect with the actors and they do trust you because they're three feet away from you and they're completely bearing themselves for whatever reason. And if they don't feel that that air space is, is safe for lack of a right. better word, it's not going to be there. And there are times I think with you as well, where I've gotten off the camera and I've just been like, I can't believe that I yeah. just on snowfall. I mean, you, you weren't there, but on, on snowfall, um, Oh, the actress who plays uh, Damson's mother. I can't think of her name right Michael now. Michael Hyatt. Yeah, Michael, who's amazing. Yeah. And and she had a sequence where afterwards she just stood up and I was staring at her and she put her arms out and I, I went over and I gave her a big hug. And it was as much for her as it was for me because it was just this incredible – and we just right. stood there for a couple of seconds. But that's it. I mean I think especially when you're – especially when you're shooting a movie or even a series. Yeah. You also create a relationship with those No people. question. I know Inside you and Olivia and uh, yeah. on Manhattan oh, yeah. had this incredible relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. But part of that is nurtured out of this intimacy yeah. that you're all sort of feeling. Yeah. And I think so many operators underestimate that. I mean, they can be storytellers. They can point. also be technically proficient. But they underestimate the sort of ability to connect with the people that they are dancing with, yeah. you know, their dance partners. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, I've just been told to dance with you as opposed to, no, you are dancing with them. Yeah. And you better – understand their moves and who they are. And that's why through a series, it becomes a really beautiful thing that, no uh, question. Uh, oh, Dave's here and uh, I'm going to try this. And, uh, and it's great. It becomes a very different thing. There's a, yeah. Uh, it's, that's a great point that actually, I don't know that I've, t I've touched on with other people. So I'm so glad you brought it up. You're a very visual storyteller, <laughs> uh, which is one of the reasons I love working with you. How do you approach a scene visually to try to figure out where you start with it, where you go with it, right. and and is there anything you can offer up on that? Is that too? Maybe that's too too. Well, no. Large. Here's what's fascinating to me is that I'm considered a visual filmmaker. I uh, think you are. No, no, <laughs> nobody. And, else and by the way, so do others. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. I'm not yeah. denying it. I never came into this. I came into this as I said. I I was an actor for a while, yeah. and then um, and and I had done a little bit of theater, and I had you know I kept. That, you know, all I knew was get me in a room with actors mm -hmm. and I can, uh, what I know I for you. sure, and that has been the best of my experience, the place that I feel most safe with is I'm pretty sure, and I've had some not great experiences, mm -hmm. but for the most part, 95% of all the actors I've worked with truly believe, I might not have given them the best direction, but believe I'm in the trenches with them. Yeah. That is what I do. There's no and question. so from my point of view, I would think of myself as an actor's director. And yet, I think because of trying to then figure out the dance, that the visual dance, mm -hmm. of why I'm doing this on film, I've sort of figured out another way to visually tell that story. Mm -hmm. But it is completely motivated by the story I'm telling. Yeah. And so I, I do get frustrated if something feels visually uninteresting to me. Yep. I mean, really frustrated. Yeah, I've seen like, it. <laughs> but, but I don't want that to get in the way of, God, this is just more interesting now. Yeah. Whew. I remember actually a, a thing with John, and I don't know if you remember, there was a scene. Was it on Manhattan? John Lindley yeah. on Manhattan. And I had blocked the whole scene. And again, we were, you know, 
We were under a lot of, you know, financial constraints after yep. I built a set that cost everybody way too much money. <laughs> so we had to figure set. out ways to shoot this show. Yeah. And it was really great the way that John lit the show so that yeah. we could kind of go in there and shoot most of it. And we, I blocked this whole scene. And um, it was John looking – John Benjamin Hickey yeah. uh, well, scene yeah. where he's looking for ear things to plug his ears. I think it was either the pilot or the oh, No, that must have been in the pilot because he, he had the tinnitus. He had the tinnitus, yeah. 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 And I just remember we blocked it, and uh, I it, it was done, and it was uh, telling the story, and everything was fine. And Lindley uh, probably read with me the way I would read with you when you're you had a furrowed brow or something. You have another idea. <laughs> he you, went, "You're not happy. You're not happy." Yeah. Uh, I think and I, I went, remember. "No, I think I'm okay." He said, "You're not happy." I think I remember you being frustrated about. Yeah, and like I was that. like, I, "It's I, it just it it." First of all, I don't think it's telling the story in the most interesting way. Uh, it's telling the story, but there's a, you know, yeah. and it was like, I, he should be in his office and we should still be out here and it should be through the glass and yeah. it should be. And he went, well, let's do that. Yeah. I went, but we blocked it. We've already sent the, he said, well, let's just change yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. And it was John reading that, you know, it just wasn't right. Yep. And so how to make the storytelling, which was being told. There was nothing that wasn't being told. So I, I knew what the story was. My frustration was there's a better way to tell this story still. There's a better, more visually arresting way. Yeah. So it's just starting from, okay, here's the simple way. All right. Now I know what that is. Yeah. Now I can kind of start to move it. How do we and make it change better? it yeah. and make it better, which is when I look at you with a furrowed brow or I look at John <laughs> who truly have a sense of light and a visual sense that I believe I have, but I believe is augmented enormously by the talented people that I can work with in that area. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, and another, this was a quote of mine actually, which is, and I feel about actors and it's the same way I feel about operators and DPs and everything, which yeah. is, I would much rather try to hold back a thoroughbred than to kick a mule. Uh, and, uh, it's exactly what I feel. I want thoroughbreds. Yeah. I want strong opinions because I think it is what has caused Nicola and I shooting with the steady cam early on yeah. and m watching Nicola with his one good eye figure <laughs> out how to tell the story this way yep. of a story that I'm helping him explain and understand the story I want to tell. And I learned, oh, there's all of this. So my sense of being a visual filmmaker, which I, I am and I hope to be, is because I've just had uh, a lot of great assistance That's in fantastic. that process. Yeah. You've allowed them to give you that assistance. That's the big part of it, right? Yeah, but I've allowed it because I also know at the end of the day what feels not truthful to me. Yeah. And what does feel even better than I thought yep. to me. I mean, both those things go. It's not that somebody had a bad idea. It just doesn't feel truthful to me. It feels like that's, yeah. a, that's a cool thought, but I just don't see it playing to the next scene yep. or going, you know, I'm thinking of the bigger picture than just this scene. How do yeah. we fix this scene? Yeah. And I've watched, you know, a lot of directors, but a lot of directors that are just figuring out the most interesting way to do that scene. Well, that might be true, but that's not going to help four scenes later that's, yeah. that you just did that. It's the larger uh, picture. Well, it, it's it, – I mean I think what you're talking about is something that I've I've tried to explain to operators and I don't know how to explain it to you to them. It's just sometimes you'll be lining something up. You'll be doing a shot. You'll be setting it up, whatever, or, or, or executing it and something bumps. And you, ju you can't ex – it doesn't make a difference why it bumps. It just something doesn't work. And, and I think you're, you're saying it in a different way. It's not true. And you have to listen to those instincts. Yeah. Uh, I mean, hopefully you have those <laughs> instincts. If you don't have those well, instincts, I don't and know. And you won't have the instincts without the enormous amount of talent. No, hopefully. no, no. I mean, and that's why I always think with incredible actors, when they're having trouble with lines. It's because it doesn't work. It's or, because the line isn't it, right. Yeah. And so I mean, Alice and Janney would have a trouble with a line. I'd go, Aaron, <laughs> you got to rewrite this. I can <laughs> promise you there's something wrong with it. Yeah. Uh, listen to it, her. It's, yeah. And, and. And it just might be where the words are and how it is, and it doesn't connect with the thought that I was bringing to it, whatever it is. And it's yeah. the same with great operators. Just doesn't feel right. Or I'm 
you know, I think it's not telling trade secrets that John Lindley has a word for moving in at the end of a scene, which is a commodities. Uh, and in some ways, it's where John and I, in some ways, creatively differ. Mm-hmm. Uh, he hates it. He just just hates it. He just and, thinks I do it too often. I don't know that yeah, he hates but it. Yeah, but I think he thinks you do it too often when we work together yes, because there's a maybe. times that I'm going – I just know that punctuation know. in telling the story and where it's not used later. Yeah. And I think it's just just the idea of it uh, for yeah. him gets a little frustrating. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he minds it. If he really minded it, he, would, he wouldn't, wouldn't be happen. joking about it, would, it. No, I know. He, he would not he, be joking about it. He does about joke it. about the thing guy who's quite just, a bit. I'm going to make a quick joke about something that's that really exactly, bothers me. And exactly I think right. we know when that happens. Yes, so, that's uh, exactly right. But um, – uh, Oh, uh, you 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 hit on something that I wanted to ask you about, but uh, and maybe it'll come back to me. Um, uh, oh, that's what it was actually. It was a story because uh, we did that interview after the live show, or maybe a couple weeks after. We were all sitting like on chairs in in the ER, and they asked us about the live show or whatever, and they showed some <laughs> they showed some video that they had taken of after one of the scenes, and you said. You know, when we came in here, you did this and that and the other, and and something was different. And I said, "Yeah, I'm doing it different every time because I don't want to sort right. of fall into something." And you paused and you said, "Good, good." And then you turned to me and you said, "Do you have any idea what you're actually going to do tonight?" <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think I turned to you. I was like, "Not really." Go, oh, okay, good. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, which was an interesting experience. That whole the li- the, the live, live show. show. Yeah. Well, but that's that's uh, that's where I kind of met you, and as you said on on. Uh, <laughs> On the Deacons project, I project that sort of made it sound like I showed you what live TV was, which could, nothing could be further from the truth. But I do no. remember, I do remember after we met, getting that I think it was unless uh, um, like this VHS camera from Circuit City. It was like the lowest technology, and figuring out all the shots with you, and right. that's sort of where I was like, oh, this guy like has great ideas and wants to tell stories. Yeah, and I thought, I mean, that's a really interesting uh, show about operators yeah. and about bringing operators in from different disciplines because there are different, much like you said, as an operator, I sort of know where my talent lies. So if it's going to be a little bit more restrictive and more, I'm not going to be the best person to do that. I know for me, there are shows that they could say, would you, you know, early, especially early in my career that I said no to, not because I don't want to do that show. I just didn't think I'd be good at it. Uh, And it wasn't out of my fear because there I've done things that like sure. the ER live that I'm going that there's no way I know how to do this. Thing. <laughs> Nobody but, knew how uh, to do it. So that seems exciting. Yeah. But my fear can be met in some way. Well, those operators who came in were fascinating because they were the top of the top of the top in live television. But live television was well, they the were, Olympics and the they Grammys were, and the Yeah, this and they were more than other. just that. Yeah. There was also to me the greatest handheld uh operator uh in te- in in rock and roll yeah. and in Don Lenzer. Oh, Don, who, uh, yeah, Don yeah, Lenzer yeah. was also – that was my first thing. I want to bring Don in, who had yeah. done docs, who had had this sort of sense yeah. that Don Lenzer and I had worked together with John Lindley yeah. and Paul Goldsmith and like five great operators on this Bette Midler project. That oh, did. okay. Yeah. And they were all the operators on there. They, all five – I mean, they're all of the operators were like – Those guys were amazing. They unbelievable. Were unbelievable. And the funny, the funny thing is – they were sort of looking to me for the the storytelling stuff right. that I was so used to, and I was looking for them to how do you do live television? I have no idea, and I was definitely farther down the right. But those are the three disciplines. Yeah. I mean, the three disciplines was straight storytelling, episodic, yep. which is what you were bringing to that. Don Lenzer, documentary filmmaking, uh, handheld, extraordinary. I mean. Uh, in that Bette Midler thing, he did a thing where, I, and then I went, "That's great operating," which wow. was. He was right up. She was singing the Beast of Burden. Okay. And he's right in there with her. He's on stage with her. And then she just violently just drops down and he does not move. He does he doesn't fucking move an inch. And then she pops back up into That's fucking fantastic. frame. And you go, Oh my God. You, you didn't, oh my you God. Didn't try I to mean like the idea that he knew, don't try to follow her at this moment. Don't uh yeah. nothing. I'm on. That's this amazing. Is what it is. And 
And he was but a that's fascinating a guy. That's a comfort zone, right? Knowing uh, I'm committing. Oh, my heavens. And Don was the first, so I knew that. Then I it was like, okay, now all these guys from live TV. And so my recollection is, I, of course I needed the Steadicam operator. I yeah. just didn't know who that was. And yeah. that was a, a new Steadicam operator who was like <laughs> 11. Uh, so I'm supposed to use him too. I wasn't much older, but, uh, the, and, and so I, those were the disciplines. Yeah. But then it was like, okay, speaking of, trying to figure that out and trying to not be insensitive to the different talents that were there. And it was one of those wonderful collaborative, it was great. I can learn from you, you can learn from me, the sound, you know, Ed Green, who, oh, you yeah. know, the sound mixer, yep. and then we used to stop people yeah. from that. You know, it was just so many different filmmaking disciplines yeah. thrown in together to do this one thing that was fucking live, yeah. you know, uh, that was... It seemed That's unachievable when we first started That's out. I, re I remember thinking even up until, I mean, almost up until we were ready to do it, or maybe up until the rehearsals beforehand, like, I don't totally know that this is going to work. Well, the Wednesday uh, night didn't work. I mean, the, the rehearsal, the, that first rehearsal Wednesday night. I don't remember that. Because we, we shot it all. Yeah. And that was what we were supposed to send. As the backup. To, as the backup yeah. to uh, NBC in, in case the feed went down or something. And John like and I met afterwards. John Wells and I met afterwards, and we went. And both who had been in theater know yeah. that a bad dress rehearsal usually, I mean, a bad final That's dress a good rehearsal sign. is a good okay. opening night sign. And we went, well, let's hope, because that was terrible. <laughs> did, and then Carol did, Flint and John and I, because you remember, or maybe not, we then came in the next day and rehearsed and reblocked some of the stuff. That didn't work. I don't remember before it, but, the, but, the show that oh, night. So you're, you're saying scenes. It's not that the technology didn't work or whatever. It's just like the scenes didn't play. Yeah, it just uh, it didn't yeah, have the energy. Yeah, the whatever. technology was kind of there. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Uh, To a degree, yeah. I mean, a couple of things had gone, but not. That was kind of okay. So more importantly, my part was working, but your part was not working. That's right. That's right. Uh, you did exactly what was asked of you, and I went, uh-oh, uh, I, can I can't change this in the edit room. Oh, boy. So I'm going to have to change it. So what we I made a decision I, of I don't remember that is anyone, we but. didn't send that to NBC. Yeah, we basically you? said, you know what, throw hell and high water up. Yeah, uh, have you know, something else go, ready to go. Whatever, go, yeah, yeah. 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 throw one of Clooney's great episodes as a rerun. <laughs> uh, sorry, we had technical difficulties, and now you'll watch truly ER. Or they just uh, cut to like the American flag, like they used to yeah, do when the, the, when the, the TV turned the off at the end of the uh, night. Of that. Um, so we didn't have a backup that, I didn't at know all. that. That's uh, amazing. <clears throat> That's amazing. Uh, yeah. Wow. Uh, going back to operating, is there something that an operator can do on your set I mean, barring, you know, yeah. insanity. That's just a complete, that's not what you want. Like some new operator, What's what are the things yeah, that they uh, shouldn't? Uh, honestly? Yeah. <clears throat> has nothing to do with operating. Yeah, I already said it. It That they act out on the set in front of the actors. Gotcha. Uh, and to me, that's... Yes, uh, agreed. That, that can't be... You, it, it, it's like you made a mistake in the shot. You did this. You tried something that no one asked you or even told you not to do. Yeah. And you did it. All of that can be sort of dealt with. Suck it me. up until you get back to the monitors, yeah, basically. But, but to sort of, uh, one of two things, either uh, to be, uh, to really act out, you know, your own frustration or something else yep. in front of the actors. Not in front of me, not in front, you have every right to do that, but it, in that moment it's of just the just specifically scene. destroying the, the... Just, honestly, uh, after a period of time, if I start to notice that the person looks bored, hmm. that the person just feels like, okay, is that it? Uh, it just, it, 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 there's a lot of jobs that you can get away with that on a film set. Yep. But as an operator, you cannot, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm sure for many operators, there are moments where I am bored. Yeah. Uh, I, this is not what I want to be doing. I don't believe in the scene. I think the script is not that great. I think whatever, all of those things... But you're just too close to the center of gravity yeah. to not be responsible for making sure you don't fall into the hole. Just basically uh, you're saying because of the ripples that that sends out to exactly everybody right. else. It, it's yeah. exactly right. You have every right to be that. Yeah. But you have to learn much like a director has to learn. Yep. It's a very similar skill set, sure. which is that art of duplicity. doesn't mean that you have to go, hey, that was so great. You don't have to do any of that. Yeah. You just have to make sure that 
you have to be aware yeah. because you have to be sure of those actors. It's just about actors. Now, there's things that you're shooting that you're on a 400 millimeter and, you know, you're two blocks away That's or a something different else. Story, but or no. there's, there's stunt stuff that you're frustrated because somebody could be hurt. Yeah. Or you, you know, there's, there's ways to abort. There's ways to be able to actually, but the conceptual idea that those people, yeah. whether you respect them or not, are sticking their necks way out to be an actor. You got to be, and you person. have to understand yeah. that. And as frustrated as you are sometimes yep. with the behavior of certain actors, uh, or the misconception of behavior, because there's two different forms of behavior, bad behavior for actors, from my point of view. Oh, interesting. There's one, which is the clinical narcissist, yeah. who's really just trying to mess everybody else up. There's another that looks exactly the same. But it's actually just somebody who's in the spiral of shame, who's just not believing they're doing the best they can and they don't know how to get out of it. And it looks like they're attacking everything or it looks like they only care about themselves. Yeah. But it's about I just I'm just not there. I just don't. So like they're them. lashing out of out of insecurity. You're saying that's exactly right. To, there are some and people who are just. They're just bad people. Yeah, and every, there's, and every there's walk clinical narcissism yeah. that that level of empathy yes. uh, doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Uh, and so, but, and that gets confusing, I think, to crews yeah. because they'll also see somebody who's late or somebody who's going, oh, I need this, or, and they're doing all sorts of bullshit, what appears bullshit, but it's they're scared to death. Uh, yeah. And it's because they actually have to stick their neck out. Yep. Yep. I yep. mean, yes, as an operator, you're sticking your neck out. Yes, as a director, but not what these actors yeah. are doing. And so you have to treat them all with the level of professionalism you know many of them have, even if the ones who don't have that are in front of you. And so yeah. as an operator, I think it's just a and, – and I think that takes experience. I think it's just – I'm around it a lot. I kind of get it. I understand what this is. And, being and I want to be nurturing. Right? I don't mean that I have to go up there and help them. No. I just want to in some ways not put any more fucking gas on the fire. <laughs> yeah. And I, I can't put out the fire. That's yeah. somebody else's job. Yeah. But I certainly don't need to ignite it or to, to stoke exasperate. The yeah. And well, so I've, I've it's had, a big part of the job. I, it's, no, you know what? I'm so glad you said that because I'm aware of it. I would. I. I don't think I've ever. I don't think I've ever verbalized it the way you just did. But that's a that's an ex incredible note for people. And just as an aside, I mean, I've had situations where I've been on a show for a little bit and I've become very very close with some of the actors, which. I mean, I'm very proud of the fact that generally that's the case because, yeah. I mean, well, and with a number of people, whatever. But I've had situations, I can think of one or two, where an actress has come on set and took me aside and said, listen, I have a really, really big day and it's a tough day. So I just want to let you know, number one, I'm not going to talk to you today. Like, I don't want to talk to you. And number two, if there's a note, just give it to me and I'm, I may even be rude to you. But I just want to let you know ahead of time, it's, that's what's going on. Uh, great. Fine. Fantastic. <laughs> and and then literally it's just like, okay, so that's where your headspace is. And I couldn't, A, appreciate that more. B, uh, by the way, be more touched that they that they yeah. feel that way, do you know? And then and then one specifically at the end of the day, uh, they, they wrapped her and uh, she walked off set. And then she came back and she gave me a big hug. She didn't say anything. And she walked away. And I was like, great. It's all, and the next day it was just, you know. By the way, that's also usual. okay even if they do it after the fact. Uh, do uh, which uh, what they did, oh, yeah. even if hey, they I'm do so it. After sorry, the fact. if they uh, act out all yeah. day and then they realize this is the reason, and I'll, I owe I'll give you, you yeah. uh, my thing of how I can tell the difference between these two worlds. For me, beautiful, yeah. which was my very first ER. Okay, my very very first ER. It was, and my very first scene with uh, ER. And so this like, must have been season one or two, probably. Yeah, right? season like, one. Pretty early. Uh, yeah. It's like late in the season. Yeah, season one. So it was already a massive, massive. And I think it was – yeah. And, and it was a pool – it was a, at the Biltmore Hotel and it was a pool table between Anthony and George. And George was getting an award for something. Yeah. Uh, and so this was before he was going to get the award. He and Anthony were having this sort of okay. little bit of a battle. And yeah. it was a very emotional scene. Because and, because George's character was getting it and Anthony's wasn't. So No, were, because George's or, character was getting it and didn't feel that he was entitled oh, to Oh, I see it. what you're saying. Okay. And that yeah, his father was going to be there. And they'd never dealt with his father's relationship with okay. his father. And so it was all... He's going through some shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
And I had only heard George Clooney, and it was like, you know, yeah. George Clooney was still George Clooney on ER at that point. But still, uh, but still. And still, yeah. and, and it was also ER. So I was like, this is so exciting, and I work so hard because the choreography on a pool scene yeah. is like, the ball's got to go here, <laughs> yeah, and good. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. you guys should be across the table yep. during this moment. But now you've also got to be shooting pool, and I don't want it that you're just standing there talking and not moving for... So it was... You know, and I had worked so hard on it. And so we're starting to do the rehearsal and, you know, probably out of my own, you know, uh, insecurity or whatever, I was probably giving more direction than was necessary. Uh, but still, it was clear that it was all direction about the scene yeah. and about, and Anthony picked up on it right away. This yeah. guy has been fucking working. Yeah. George, on the other hand, was unbelievably short with me mm -hmm. and kind of, I could just tell this, I, I, I'm obviously not penetrating here. <laughs> this is not. And then at one point, you know, cause it wasn't a closed set. It yeah. was like, um, one point he just turns to me and goes, you know what? Just tell me where you want me. I don't give a shit what the thing is. Ooh. And was enormously dismissive of me. Yeah. And, and actually humiliated me in front of everybody. Ugh. And, uh, and so the scene finishes, uh, and Anthony, who then realized Anthony was like, you know, uh, a Sheltie, you know, uh, animal, you know, I can herd, uh, I can herd the cows yeah. going this way and I know how to uh, do this and could tell what I needed and was yeah. very, was such an ally. No, he's, and he's uh, the leader of that pack and, yeah, and all that but, stuff. But, it's great. So then the scene finishes and I'm sitting there and I, I'm going, I had just been put in movie jail. I mean, yeah, uh, TV jail. well, movie jail, <laughs> well, because oh. I had done Axe Murder oh, right oh, before uh, this. Sorry, yes. And I did not have a great relationship with Mike Myers. Okay. It was actually, of all my working relationships, probably really? I've had one or two not great ones. That was not a great one at so, all. It's such a great movie, though. Uh, so. <laughs> it was uh, a nightmare to do uh. and very difficult, and I never was able to reach him, and I could never be the director he needed, uh, and uh, it was... Uh, you know, it oh was the, not a, a, a pleasant thing, Ugh. but it was what I had realized is probably very early on. I should have had a talk with Mike rather than I can win him over. I know I've been able to win. It's what I started with saying. I was an actor's director. I, I <clears throat> eventually he's going to realize I'm in the trenches with you. Mm -hmm. It's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. That never happened. Mm -hmm. And maybe there should have been a discussion early on mm -hmm. that this isn't happening. Yeah. So I thought, well, I'm going to go talk to George. Uh, this is at was, the beginning of the episode, yeah. probably uh, as well. Like this was the first shot. Oh, the first. Oh, the very oh, first I, scene. I missed that. Sorry. So okay. I had the very, very first scene. You've got eight days left. And yes, was, and yeah. so I go to his trailer. I knock on the door. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I was like, oh god, I'm so nervous. I said, could I uh, just have a conversation with you? And he said, sure, come in. I said, listen, George, um, I. I, I'm not here. I'm not trying to win an Emmy. I'm not. I, I think this show is extraordinary. I think what you guys are doing is extraordinary. I'm so honored to be here. I'm working really hard. And I'm completely comfortable not having any conversation with you in any scene between now and eight days from now. Mm -hmm. We don't have to talk. We don't even have to. You can go do your scene. I'll give you no direction. But you had no right to talk to me the way mm -hmm. you did in front of that whole crew on yeah. my very first day. And George just immediately did what that actress did to you. Yeah. Uh, immediately. I am so, so sorry. I'm so frightened of this scene. I haven't had to deal with wow. the kind of level of emotion in this show yet yeah. as what this is. I took it all out on you. I am so sorry. And literally from that day on, I see George. I couldn't be more yeah. uh, comfortable he, seeing a human being. He's great. Uh, I've had nothing but respect for him. It was and and it was a lesson that I had learned from the worst experience of my sure, career, sure. which is, and it's probably a lesson for operators. It's probably a lesson for all of us. An operator, if it's overwhelming the relationship between the DP and the operator, mm -hmm. one or the other, and it should probably be the operator who goes to the DP and going, I'm doing something that's not making you happy. Yep. Uh, because I'm terrorized on these wheels right now. Yeah, yeah, I'm just, yeah. I, I think I'm going to do that. Can we have some discussion? Can we just figure out some better way to work together yep. so I can do better work? Um, and I think it just that level, you don't have to do it right away on everything, but 
when you start to see that this is not going to end well. I think once um, it becomes a cycle is when, or you're seeing yeah. it's becoming a cycle. And, 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 and I've done that with, with DPs before. I've done it with directors before, whatever. But what I always do, which you sort of hit on, is I always go, look, I don't think something's working. And I feel like maybe there's something I'm doing or I'm not doing. What can I do better? What right. can I do worse? And actually now, a lot of times when I work with a DP, after the first day, and usually at the end of the first week, I'll always go, all right, so we got like some, even if things are going well, we, we've got, we've got some, you know, we've got some land down behind us. Like what, what can I improve on? What do I, I know I'm idiosyncratic. I have so what doesn't work, what does work nine times out of 10. They're like, no, everything's great. But sometimes they'll go, you know, uh, do me a favor. When you change the lens, double check with me first. Cause uh, or whatever, right. I, I don't know what it is. And I think that's invaluable. No, that's, that's a great piece of advice. Yeah. yeah that's, that's uh, I think for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no question. Uh, well, listen, um, I could talk to you for 12 hours, but we probably both have to go do stuff at some point. Do you have any other final tidbits uh, you want to throw out there? No, just um, never come to the set without knowing exactly what that scene is about for any operator. And I have seen operators now come to a set and they have the sides and I realize they're reading the sides for the first time mm -hmm. and they're kind of going, okay, what are we doing today? Okay, I see it. And to me... Even if that's there, don't make that obvious. Uh, make sure that it looks like, I know I did my homework last night, just like everybody else does their homework. And I'm coming to the set with the idea of, I know the scene we're shooting and I'm, uh, I have my own thoughts about that scene. And then they're a filmmaker as opposed to, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, which one, who, who's saying what here? What is that? Um, and um, and it's, it's sides, <laughs> people getting sides or it's the bane of, you know, uh, you should already know what that is. You shouldn't be reading the scene for the first time. That's it. Victor, 30 echo, take two. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. And camera set. Background.